morning. How's everybody doing today? Outstanding. And all of you who are joining us from home, whether home be right here in West Virginia or all the way over in Kuala Lumpur or Indonesia, anywhere around the world, we welcome you and we're honored that you chose to be with us today. We've got some quick announcements to go through here this morning. The first of which is not going to appear on the screen, but I'm going to make a big deal out of it because tomorrow night at 730 at Second Presbyterian Church in Huntington, West Virginia. And here he comes down front right now. You got a question? Oh, you don't have a question for me. Oh, good, because I don't have any answers this morning except the ones from the Word. Aaron is going to be uh, sharing the Word tomorrow night at the movement. Aaron Smith, our own Aaron Smith, our, our, our um, uh, media minister here at the church is going to be sharing the Word of God there at the movement, and I would encourage all of you who are here to come on out and support one of our own who's going to be teaching there. And those of you who are online and watching here, you can check it out by going to the movement on, on, uh, on uh, Facebook. They've got a re, uh, movement live on Facebook Live, and you can find it there. Check it out and watch it. Bible study at our church every Thursday evening at 6 o'clock, and we serve dinner as well. So come on out and have some, have some chow and have some chow for the body and some chow for the soul. On Thursday evenings, we got a nursery available. If you got babies, it's, it's available back there. Uh, breathing room tonight. Don't forget about that, ladies. Those of you who have been coming, keep coming. And those of you who haven't been able to make it, come on out because it's a good time for the ladies. Also, if you want to become a member of our church and you haven't become a member yet, all you have to do is fill out the digital connection card on your app that you can find on your phone, or you can fill out one of the cards over here, drop it in the offering plate. If you're ready to find a place to serve in our church, just mark that on there. We'll find you a place to serve because we've got plenty of opportunities. If you don't have our app, download it. It's called Renewal Chapels. It's simply Renewal Chapels. It's on um, the Apple App Store and on Google Play, and the app is awesome. Uh, Aaron's done a great job working with uh, Subsplash. Alcoholics Anonymous men's meeting this afternoon, 115 here at the church. Be sure to be here, all you guys who are interested in being a part of that. If you would like to give today, you can do so at our website. Some of you may be watching through our website this morning, www.renewalchapels.com. You may be watching through the app, and you can give through the app as well. And you can send in by mail at the uh, P.O. box number there that's listed. And also, if you're here in the room and you want to give, there's two baskets over there. Drop it in the offering plate. Today, we continue on a series of messages uh, in the book of Daniel called Godly Living in an Ungodly Culture. And today, I'd like to introduce our sermon, this sermon, by reading a passage from the book of Psalms. Now, you keep asking, somebody may be asking themselves, why does Pastor Booth constantly read the Psalms as an introduction to the service before he preaches on Daniel? Why would he not be reading Daniel? Because if you read Daniel and you study Daniel enough, you'll find that Daniel was extremely adept in the Psalms. He knew the Psalter from beginning to end. He understood it. He comprehended it, and his words reflect his words, even though his words are history and prophecy, his words reflect a clear understanding of the Psalms, the songs, and the wisdom reflected in the Psalms and the songs within the Psalms. Today, we're going to look at Psalm 66. It'll be on your screen. You can read along with me as I read where the psalmist David writes, shout joyfully to God, all the earth, sing the glory of his name, make his praise glorious. Say to God, how awesome are your works. Because of the greatness of your power, your enemies will give feigned obedience to you. All the earth will worship you and will sing praise to you. They will sing praises to your name. Come and see the works of God, who is awesome in his deeds toward the sons of men. He turned the sea into dry land. They passed through the river on foot. There let us rejoice in him. He rules by his might forever. His eyes keep watch on the nations. Let not the rebellious exalt themselves. Bless our God, O peoples, 
and sound his praise abroad who keeps us in life and does not allow our feet to slip. For you have tried us, O God. You have refined us as silver is refined. You have brought us into the net. You laid an oppressive burden upon our loins. You made men ride over our heads. We went through fire and through water, yet you brought us out into a place of abundance. I shall come into your house with burnt offerings. I shall pay you my vows, which my lips uttered and my mouth spoke when I was in distress. I shall offer you burnt offerings of fat beasts with the smoke of rams. I shall make an offering of bulls with male goats. Come and hear all who fear God, and I will tell of what he has done for my soul. I cried to him with my mouth, and he was extolled by my tongue. If I regard wickedness in my heart, the Lord will not hear, but certainly God has heard. He has given heed to the voice of my prayer. Blessed be God who has not turned away my prayer nor his loving kindness from me. Let's pray. Father God, thank you that you are a God that though you put us in a net, even though you lay great burdens upon us, even though we walk through fire and through water, you always have a purpose, and your purpose is always the best interest of us, of we, your people. You refine us from lead or steel or tin or nickel, and you boil away all the dregs through those heavy weights you place upon us, and you refine us like pure silver and pure gold. We thank you for the hard times in our lives. We thank you for the times when we, like Nebuchadnezzar in the story we're going to read today, seemed almost out of, his, out of our minds as he was completely out of his. We feel as though we're going to be pulled apart in utter otherness. Yet you constantly are keeping us. You are holding us. And though we need the fire, we don't want it. And though we need the flood, we don't want it. And though we need the net, we don't want it. And though we don't, we don't want the weight, we need it. And you use it. And we thank you for the nets and the burdens and the fires and the waters. Because through them you have refined us. You have created a people for your own heart. You have created a people who worship you and honor you and show you, show you great dignity. We pray, Father God, that as we go through this day in this worship service, that we are already asking ourselves the question, what will today bring for me? What will you bring for me this morning, God? How will you change me today? What do I need to repent of? From what do I need to be redeemed by you? Let humility be our covering, body of Christ. As we speak to God today, and as we learn from God today, and as we worship God today, Father God, Thank you for all that you've done for us, but most especially, thank you for what you've accomplished for us through your son, Jesus Christ, in whose name I pray, amen. Okay, stand with us. So this song's called Anchored in Love, and it's an old-timey song, that we're, but it's got really good words. And Jesus is our anchor in the life of sea, and when the storms come, he anchors us with his love. So keep that in mind as we sing out. Found a sweet haven of sunshine 
to travel all around the different kinds. This next song is probably one of my favorite hymns. It's called um, Standing on the Solid Rock. So sing it out. This is one of our church's favorite hymns. anchored in love. We're standing on the solid rock. And now I'm going to sing, my faith has found my resting place. Did you all see, see what's happening here? Fear does not have to grip us. 
God picked you before he knew anything would happen, before you knew anything would happen, before you made a choice, he picked you. We are anchored in the foundation of the word. We stand upon the wisdom and knowledge of God. And with all that, we have a resting place that we can go and lay down and be confident. So I'd like you to close your eyes and spend some time with God before the message, asking God to reveal himself through the words that I'm singing. My faith has found a resting place, not in device nor creed. I trust the ever-living one, his wounds for me shall flee. I need no other argument. I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. Enough for me that Jesus saves this ends my fear and doubt a sinful soul i come to him he'll never cast me out i need no other argument i need no other plea it is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. My heart is leaning on the word, the written word of God. Salvation by my Savior's name salvation through his blood i need no other argument i need no other plea it is enough that jesus died and that he died for me my great physician heals the sick, the lost he came to save. For me his precious blood was shed, for me his life he gave. I need no other argument, I need no the plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. Father God, we come before you this morning acknowledging that the greatest need that we have is you. Because apart from you, we miss the mark. 
And we endure great pain when we do miss the mark. Apart from you, we cannot buy ourselves out of the mess that we've gotten ourselves into, either by money or by work. And Lord, apart from you, we exist only on our own power and pride and position and possessions. We can't do it. We can't accomplish it. We can't bring it to bear. And today we're going to look at the life of a man who, though he was one of the wealthiest men in the world, was certainly the most powerful man in the world, the known world at his time. And he was brilliant and skilled and gifted in so many ways by your gracious hand. It took great pain and suffering for him to come to the place where he acknowledged you and you alone as the most high God. And he thanked you for that pain and that problem. And we as your people this morning, we want to thank you as well. Because without the problems that we've had to endure, we would have never come to you. Thank you for the waves that slammed us into you the rock of ages, in whose name we pray, amen. Daniel chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. Nebuchadnezzar, the king, to all the peoples, nations, and men of every language that live in all the earth, may your peace abound. It has seemed good to me to declare the signs and wonders which the Most High God has done for me. How great are his signs and how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and his dominion is from generation to generation. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at ease in my house and flourishing in my palace. I saw a dream and it made me fearful. And these fantasies as I lay on my bed and the visions in my mind kept alarming me. So I gave orders to bring into my presence the wise men, all of the wise men of Babylon, that they might make known to me the interpretation of the dream. Then the magicians, the conjurers, the Chaldeans, and the diviners came in, and I related the dream to them, but they could not make its interpretation known to me. But finally, Daniel came in before me, whose name is Belteshazzar, according to the name of my God, and in whom is the spirit of the holy God. And I related the dream to him, saying, O oh, Belteshazzar, chief of the magicians, since I know that a spirit of the holy God is in you and no mystery baffles you, tell me the visions of my dream which I have seen along with its interpretation. Now, these were the visions in my mind as I lay on my bed. I was looking, and behold, there was a tree in the midst of the earth, and its height was great. The tree grew large and became strong, and its height reached to the sky, and it was visible to the end of the whole earth. Its foliage was beautiful, and its fruit abundant, and in it was food for all. The beasts of the field found shade under it. And the birds of the sky dwelt in its branches, and all living creatures fed themselves from it. I was looking in the visions in my mind as I lay on my bed, and behold, an angelic watcher, a holy one, descended from heaven. He shouted out and spoke as follows, "'Chop down the tree and cut off its branches. Strip off its foliage and scatter its fruit.'" Let the beasts flee from under it and the birds from its branches. Yet leave the stump with its roots in the ground. Put a band of iron and bronze around it in the new grass of the field and let him be drenched with the dew of heaven and let him share with the beasts in the grass of the earth and let his mind be changed from that of a man and let a beast's mind be given to him. And let seven periods of time pass over him. This, is, this sentence is by the decree of the angelic watchers 
and the decision is a command of the holy ones in order that the living may know that the Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind and bestows it on whom he wishes and sets over it the lowliest of men. This is the dream which I, King Nebuchadnezzar, have seen. Now you, Belteshazzar, tell me its interpretation inasmuch as none of the wise men of my kingdom is able to make known to me the interpretation, but you are able, for a spirit of the holy God is in you. Then Daniel, whose name is Belteshazzar, was appalled for a while, and his thoughts alarmed him. The king responded and said, Belteshazzar, do not let the dream or its interpretation alarm you. Belteshazzar replied, my Lord, if only the dream applied to those who hate you and its interpretation to your adversaries. The tree that you saw, which became large and grew strong, whose height reached the sky and was visible to all the earth and whose foliage was beautiful and its fruit abundant and in which was food for all, under which the beasts of the field dwelt and whose branches the birds of the sky lodged. It is you, O king, for you have become great and grown strong and your majesty has become great and reached to the sky and your dominion to the end of the earth. In that you saw an angelic watcher, a holy one, descending from heaven saying, chop down the tree and destroy it, yet leave the stump with its roots in the ground, but with a band of iron and bronze around it in the new grass of the field and let him be drenched with the dew of heaven and let him share with the beasts of the field until seven periods of time pass over him. This is the interpretation, O king, and this is the decree of the most high which has come upon my lord the king that you be driven away from mankind and your dwelling place be with the beasts of the field and you will be given grass to eat like cattle and be drenched with the dew of heaven and seven periods of time will pass over you until you recognize that the Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind and bestows it on whomever he wishes. And And in that it was commanded to leave the stump with the roots of the tree, your kingdom will be assured to you after you recognize that it is heaven that rules. Therefore, o, therefore, o king, may, by, may my advice be pleasing to you. Break away now from your sins by doing righteousness and from your iniquities by showing mercy to the poor in case there may be a prolonging of your prosperity. All of this happened to Nebuchadnezzar the king. Twelve months later, he was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon. The king reflected and said, is this not Babylon the great, which I myself have built as a royal residence by the might of my power and for the glory of my majesty? While the word was in the king's mouth, a voice came from heaven saying, King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is declared, sovereignty has been removed from you and you will be driven away from mankind, and your dwelling place will be the, with the beasts of the field. You will be given grass to eat like cattle, and seven periods of time will pass over you until you recognize that the Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind and bestows it on whomever he wishes. Immediately, the word concerning Nebuchadnezzar was filled, and he was driven away from mankind and began eating grass like cattle and his body was drenched with the dew of heaven until his hair had grown like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird's claws. But at the end of that period, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven and my reason returned to me and I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted nothing, but he does according to his will in the hosts of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and no one can ward off his hand or say to him, what have you done? At that time, my reason returned to me, and my majesty and splendor were restored to me for the glory of my kingdom, and my counselors and my nobles began seeking me out. 
So I was reestablished in my sovereignty, and surpassing greatness was added to me. Now, I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise, exalt, and honor the King of heaven, for all his works are true, and his ways are just, and he is able to humble those who walk in pride. As far as we know, there has not been a spade turned over in the ancient Near East that has ever given us any other word from Nebuchadnezzar than these. These are Nebuchadnezzar's last words. He did come back to power. He did live several years longer, and then he died, and his son and another person stepped in, and then his grandson, Belshazzar, which we'll read about next week, stepped into his position. Obviously, he asked Daniel, his closest advisor, the one in whom he placed his greatest trust. He asked his closest advisor to help him write this. There are scholars who say that this is an edict, a command, a demand from the king, and it is not. It is not. Chapter 4 of Daniel is Nebuchadnezzar's testimony of God's working in his life. It is a praise to God. It is a remembrance. It is an expression of gratitude to God for all that God had done for him and a thanksgiving for what God did to him so that he could understand who God was and what God had done for him. Nebuchadnezzar wanted to prepare a statement in words that would best reflect honor upon God, the most high God, and be recognizable not only to the people of Babylon, but to to the people of Israel. Daniel 4.4 assures us that the time must be near the end of his reign as king of Babylon. His goal was the rebuilding of Babylon, and it was now accomplished. And he says in verse 4, I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at ease in my house and flourishing in my palace. This was clearly the year 570 through 569 B.C., Two years earlier, Nebuchadnezzar had a very long and only somewhat successful uh, attack against the city of Tyre. It had ended, yet as Dr. Whitcomb, my professor, reminds us in his commentary on Daniel, God compensated Nebuchadnezzar by giving him the land of Egypt in fulfillment of Jeremiah's prophecy in Jeremiah 43.11 and 44.29 through 30, which you're not going to see on the screen. Nebuchadnezzar had not been able to defeat and crush the city of Tyre and the people of Tyre. It was almost immediately after receiving this frightful vision that Nebuchadnezzar rushed to Egypt to quell a rebellion that was growing in that part of his kingdom. There's a tablet that was discovered in what was then Babylon, and it reads this, in the 37th year, which would have begun on April, that, that year would have begun on April the 23rd, 568 B.C., in the 37th year, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, marched against Egypt to deliver a battle, and he won. When he returned to Babylon, full of himself, full of pride from the victory he made his prideful statement in Daniel 4, verse 30, which is not going to be on the screen. It will be later. The king reflected and said, Is this not Babylon the great, which I myself have built as a royal residence by the might of my power and for the glory of my majesty? His words were not foolish boasting either. Dr. Whitcomb further states these words, and I quote, mainly through the systematic excavation of the German archaeologist Robert Coldaway from 1899 to 1917, much of the ruins of Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon have been rediscovered. Coldaway notes the following accomplishments, which Whitcomb reiterates. Number one, the city was protected by a system of vast double walls, the outer line extending 10 miles around the double walls were each 25 feet thick with 40 feet between each wall. And the total of 200, and, there was a total of 260 towers that were 160 feet apart all along the wall. Number two, through the center of the city, 
for two-thirds of a mile extended a great 70-foot-wide stone paved procession street having walls decorated with enameled bricks showing 120 lions and 575 dragons and bulls arranged in alternate rows. Andre Perot explains that, quote, the figure of each animal stood out against a, a uniform background tinted blue with powdered lapis lazuli. The architecture and ornamentation were skillfully adapted to each other, and the animals were carved to scale, and despite their multitude, the arrangement was ordered and harmonious. At the north end of the procession street was the famous Ishtar Gate, 35 feet high decorated with 557 animals in bright colors against a glazed blue background. The original gate was brought by Coldway to Berlin, where it still resides to this day, but an exact replica can be seen at the Oriental Institute Museum in the University of Chicago. Number three, the city was dominated by a seven-story ziggurat. A ziggurat is a step pyramid. It was 288 feet high, known as the Tower of Babylon. Nearly 60 million fired bricks were used to construct this huge tower, and on top of it stood the Temple of Marduk. That was Nebuchadnezzar's favorite god until he met Yahweh. And in the Temple of Marduk stood a gold, solid gold, not gold overlay, but a solid gold statue of Marduk, which weighed 52,000 pounds, according to the 5th century Greek historian Herodotus, who actually saw it with his own eyes. Finally, at the north end of the city, near the Ishtar Gate, was Nebuchadnezzar's palace. His throne room was 171 feet long by 56 feet wide, having a triple gateway, richly decorated facade of glazed bricks, yellow columns whose superimposed iconic capitals were crowned with palmettes and were linked to each other by a garland of carved lotus buds. At the northeast angle of the palace are the remains of vaults thought by Coldaway to be supports for the terraced hanging gardens built by Nebuchadnezzar for Amethyst, his Median bride as a reminder of her homeland. It was built upon stone arches and was equipped with a draw well and chain pump. The hanging gardens of Babylon were counted as one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. So as you can see, Nebuchadnezzar was no slouch. <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar was quite true when he started boasting about what he had accomplished. The book of Daniel over and over and over and over again has been proven to be true. Every time a spade is turned over, it's shown to be accurate again. This is a story of repentance, redemption, and humility. This is the story of a man whose great brilliance would have made anyone phenomenally prideful, had accomplished outstanding things in his rather short life to this point. He had accomplished a monumental group of tasks and was a brilliant man. And he was full of pride. He was full of selfishness. He was full of self-will. God had used him to crush the nation of Judah because Judah would not surrender and submit to God. He sent Nebuchadnezzar to crush them. The Assyrians had already crushed the northern kingdom of Israel some years earlier. Israel was gone. All that was left was a southern kingdom known as Judah. And he sent Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was a phenomenal, phenomenal man. And we've already seen in him 
in Daniel when Daniel was able to, to tell him the dream and interpret the dream. And then when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego got into their situation, we've already seen three times where Nebuchadnezzar has seemed like he was leaning more away from his gods and toward the God of Israel. But always there were things that just in his words, there were always things that stood out. For example, he did homage to Daniel. In his words here in four, chapter 4, he does no homage to any human being. In each one of the other places, when he shows some sign of repentance, he issues an edict and an order. Here he issues no orders. He just says what he's experienced. In every other case, he says, if you don't obey this God, you're going to be torn limb from limb, or you're going to be killed. Your house is going to be reduced to a rubbish heap, blah, blah, blah. There's none of that here. There is a completely different heart and a completely different mindset. No more is it about doing what it takes to get him power. No more in this situation is he giving gifts to the ones who did, who helped him. Daniel, he made him king. He made him chief of the wise men of Babylon and put him over the rule of the entire province. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, he gave them administrative duties under Daniel. And then when they defied him at the fiery furnace, he gave them even more. Here he gives no one nothing except praise to God. In Daniel chapter 4, verses 1 to 3 is where we're going to start. It says these words, Nebuchadnezzar the king to all the peoples, nations, and men of every language that live in all the earth, may your peace abound. It has seemed good to me to declare the signs and wonders which the Most High God has done for me. How great are his signs, how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and his dominion is from generation to generation. There's no command. There's no edict. It's not a one of, another one of Nebuchadnezzar's decrees. These first three verses, written sometime around 550 B.C. by Daniel himself at the behest of Nebuchadnezzar, as Nebuchadnezzar employed Daniel's writing skills to communicate not only to Babylonians but to Jews, he doesn't give another decree. There's no threats. There's no homage. There's no bragging. There's no gifts or promotions. Nebuchadnezzar simply gives his testimony to the greatness of the one true God who he names, the same name that the Jews often referred to God as, the Most High God. These words are Nebuchadnezzar's personal testimony, his story, how God has worked powerfully in his life. Nebuchadnezzar is giving his lead. Except you'll notice it's not about people in his life. It's not about what he was able to do, how he was able to overcome. It was all about how God put him in those situations, and God brought him out. you see a tremendous level of repentance in his words. No more is it about him. His story, his lead, his testimony isn't about how he was able to make it through really tough times. It wasn't about how, how someone in the kingdom, it wasn't about how Daniel had helped him see the light or how this one had given him hope and this one had trusted in him and, and gave him a chance. It was no longer about people, about Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And while we need, in our world, we need to give credit where credit is due to individuals, okay? Here, when you're talking about what God has done for you, you talk about God and God alone. One of the things that impresses me the most is when I hear somebody talk about what God has done through them, to them, and for them, through me, but they don't ever mention me. I love that because their focus is upon the one who used me, and I'm just his partner. I get fired up when I hear people talk about how God has worked through Rocky Meadows or through Tom Smith or through Jeremiah Hammond, but they don't mention any of their names. They just talk about God and how great he is. 
we can get so focused on people sometimes that we get it all backwards. Yeah, God uses people. God uses people. But more than anything, we are simply channels of his blessing. And sometimes of his correction, his chastising. I am impressed with Nebuchadnezzar's radical repentance. He's changed. And that's what repentance means. It means he's changed. But he's not just changed in that he's no longer arrogant and mean to people. It's There's an inside heart change that, that that humility and kindness that comes out of him now is the source of. That inner change is the source of this humility and kindness and this gratitude and praise toward God. In other words, it's not about, oh, look how kind and humble Nebuchadnezzar is. Nebuchadnezzar says, don't look at me. Look at the God who did it. What do you do when you give your lead, your testimony? Is it all about what you've accomplished, how you've come through so much? How this one has helped you and that one has helped you? Or is it about how God has brought upon you some very painful times that, as the psalmist wrote, were like a net or like a heavy weight laid on our loins? They were like walking through hellfire or trying to trudge through a flood, just gasping to get your next breath, to take your next step or swim the next foot. And God brought that on. And I give him glory for the flood and the fire and the weight and the net that snatched me up and caught me so that I wouldn't go do any more. There's a redemption going on in this verse. There's a redemption going on in this verse. You can see the life that's been redeemed from that arrogance and pride and self-will and willfulness. How he's, he, he used his position for his own glory. He used his possessions for his own power. He used his power to build more for himself than for others. Surely some others benefited. but mostly himself. And here we see him giving credit to God. God's the one who did it all. God's the one who accomplished it. If you want to look to see if there's realness about a person, look to who they give credit for for where they're at. Look to see if they give praise for the hard times they went through. Look to see if they're still rejoicing and telling big stories about the wild days because you don't see any of that here. There's no rejoicing. And, hey, remember when we used to get together? And, and then the story declines from there. No more of those stories. All there is is the story of God and what he's done. Redemption. <sighs> But also, these words are filled with humility. There's two things that he, two words that he uses here that I want to camp out on for just a second. The first word is signs, his signs. And you know what a sign is for? It's to keep you from doing something foolish, right? You drive down the highway, it says, you, know, you go up the road here, and it kind of says, road work ahead, slow to 35 miles an hour. It's got flashing lights. When flashing, the speed limit is 35 miles an hour. <laughs> and it's flashing for a reason because we're so used to seeing signs that we need a little flash to remind us, hey, hey here's a sign. And we've got this comedian that tells a joke and then says, here's your sign. Okay, listen up. Some of you have had signs on top of signs, on top of signs, on top of signs, on top of signs stuck right in front of your face. And you've pretty much gave them all the finger. 
Yeah, I can get through this. I can make it. I can do this. I got this, baby. This is Jeremy. That's, that's, that's Nebuchadnezzar. And he says, how great are his signs. They're magnificent. They're huge. You can't miss them. When you see them, you can either do one of two things. You can either reject them or you can surrender to them. You can, there's a road out here on 152 going home right now. There's a sign out there on the road because they've been working on the road, and it's still flashing even though the road work is done. And the flashing, it's still flashing, says reduce speed to 35 miles an hour. The normal speed limit through there is 55. And even though the road work is done, when I go through there, guess what I do? I slow down to 35 miles an hour. I know I don't have to anymore, but I still slow down because I don't know what's going on because there's still equipment sitting by the side of the road. I don't know whether they're going to be coming back, cleaning that mess up again and getting that equipment loaded up. And there could be all kinds of work there. And there's people involved. You know what happens when you don't pay attention to God's signs? You're not the only one that gets hurt. Whoever is in your life gets hurt too. I have drugged my wife and my children through so many struggles because I would not see the signs. The second word he uses is wonders. These are things that shock you. They amaze you. You're just overwhelmed by seeing what God has done. And sometimes they're just little tiny things. And they're only, they're only wonders to you. And you explain that wonder to somebody else and somebody else is sitting there going, okay, so big deal. What's the big deal? But to you, that thing is a wonder, and it's not just a wonder. It is a mighty, powerful, strong wonder. It catches your attention, grabs you by the throat, and says, listen up. That's what he's talking about. Do you understand the absolute love of God in showing you those signs? Do you see the amazing, overwhelming, loving kindness and loyalty to you in those wonders that he's brought into your life that have just opened your eyes suddenly, and there it is. How come when we see them so often, we don't reject them, but we go, hey, man, that's cool, and we go ahead and do exactly what we want to do? It's because of pride, because this whole passage is overwhelming. This whole book is consumed with the idea of man's pride, and in these first five, first four chapters, it's been about Nebuchadnezzar's pride and the pride of those who were under him. And we're going to see the pride of Belshazzar, his grandson, next week. What is it about humans and pride that we can't just simply bow and humble ourselves before the God of heaven? We're so ready, ready to give a command or an edict to bless somebody with what we have. Give them this and give them that and help them here and do that for them because they've helped us. It's a we, you scratch my back, I scratch yours culture. But the, with the Most High God, it's not. And he brings actions that cause our repentance so that he can redeem and level us in humility before himself first and with one another second. Daniel chapter 4, verse 27. Therefore, Daniel says to King Nebuchadnezzar, therefore, O king, may my advice be pleasing to you. Break away now from your sins by doing righteousness and from your iniquities by showing mercy to the poor in case there may be prolonging of your prosperity. The way that he puts this here, and there's only two people in this room that will understand what I'm talking about, and if Jordan's watching, he'll be. I saw him watching earlier. Jordan, if you're watching, you'll know what I'm talking about. The verb breaking away is called appeal imperative. Appeal stem in the Hebrew is active, but it's intensive active. It is break away now. You better break away. And it's in the imperative. It's a command. Daniel is commanding the king, you better break away now. And since it is an imperative, a command, and since it is so intensive, what does this mean? This means it's an immediate action, and it takes, it takes immediacy and intrepidity. It takes courage. That's what intrepidity means. 
This is going to take some guts on your part because it's going to be tough and it's going to be hard. How did you quit smoking cigarettes? Did you cut down from 10 a day to 9 a day, from 9 a day to 8 a day, from 8 a day to 7 a day? No, because somewhere around day four, you're going to end up smoking an entire pack. (laughs) Because you're going to get Jones in real bad. How did you quit drugs? How did you quit alcohol? Did you quit by saying, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm, I'm, going, to, I'm going to cut down from a cube a day to 20 a day. Then I'll cut down to 15 a day. No, you say, I'm going to quit, and you quit. This is what this breaking away means. It means breaking off, snapping it, yanking it out. I'm done. It's got to be over with, and it's got to be over with now. And I want to tell you what, that takes intentionality, it takes immediacy, and it takes intrepidity or courage. You've got to have some backbone to do that. Amen? And everybody in this room knows spot on exactly what I'm talking about. And many of you at home do too. And some of us around still playing little games, saying, oh, I can gradually get away from this, or I can gradually get away from that. Let me tell you something. Uh, Zig Ziglar, who has nothing to do with Daniel, obviously, but Daniel, Zig Ziglar made a statement. I saw him speaking in Lemon Grove, California, 25 years ago, 20 years ago, and he said, if you want to change, here's how you change. In 21 days, 21 to 30 days, you can develop an entirely, you can lose a habit and start a new habit. In 21 to 30 days, you can lose a habit and start a new habit. He said it's simply this. Don't, don't try to gradually get away from it. Your actions have to be immediate. They have to be courageous. And they have to be now, right now. You make the decision, you choose the decision, and you go with the decision, and you don't turn back. Amen? That's what it's all about. He says to, he says to, to, that, to, to Nebuchadnezzar, break away now from your sins. It's not a broad swath word. It literally means break away now from missing the mark. Stop missing the mark. Now, how in the world are we going to do that? Because the Bible says in Romans chapter 3 or 6, we all have sinned and fall short. We don't even hit the target. We fall short. When we shoot the arrow of our lives out there, it falls into the ground before it even gets to the target. So in other words, what's he saying? Break away now from your sins because you're going to have to lean on God if you want to hit the mark. And then he says, by doing what is right, the word is righteousness. It means righteousness just means do the right thing. We say it all the time in the addiction community. What's our choice today? We're going to do what? The next right thing. And that's the key. That's what Daniel is saying here. Nebuchadnezzar, do the next right thing, please. And then he says, and break away also from your iniquities. Now, what are iniquities? Iniquities are very simply put, it's just simple wrongdoing, or it can be the punishment or the result of our wrongdoing. And what he's saying here, your iniquities, your results of your wrongdoing, affects other people, and it affects mostly the poor. And the word poor here, that's not just financially poor, but spiritually poor, people who are very humble, people who are meek, people who are followers and not leaders. These are the people who need leaders who are going to break away from wrong and do right, who are going to break away from pride, and they're going to do what? They're going to show mercy. In other words, they're going to reveal grace. The the word doesn't really mean mercy. It means show favor, show grace. What is grace? It's when I give you what you don't deserve and you could never earn on your own. That's what grace is. Final verses, chapter 4, verses 34 through 37. But at the end of that period, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven, and my reason returned to me, and I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom endures from generation to generation All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, but he does according to his will in the hosts of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and no one can ward off his hand or say to him, what have you done? 
At that time, my reason returned to me, and my majesty and splendor were restored to me for the glory of my kingdom, and my counselors and nobles began seeking me out. So I was reestablished in my sovereignty, and surpassing greatness was added to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise, exalt, and honor the king of heaven, for all his works are true, and his ways are just, and he is able to humble those who walk in pride. Do you see the humility here? Do you see the repentance here? And do you see the redemption of God here? God brought that into Nebuchadnezzar's life that was so miserably painful. It is an actual, it is an actual disorder. It's called boanthropy, and it literally means an ox mind where you begin to act like an ox and you want to get on your hands and knees and eat grass and go out away from people, and people have lived their lives like this. And at some point in time, things come back together for most of them. And what do we do to those that we know who are struggling with mental health concerns like this man did? Well, the, the community turns away. I have a person that I know in my life that has struggled for decades with schizoaffective disorder. And I can regularly, in, my, in our community, regularly hear people laughing. And you want to talk about something that ticks me off. And that's, that's something that make me up, get me upset. Somebody's dealing with depression, horrific depression, to the point to where they don't want their life to go on. And somebody else is just fed up with that. They're fed up with dealing with that. Well, I'll tell you what, you let it hit you, and let's see what you do. Somebody's dealing with anxiety that's over the top, that sends it, shoots them into panic attack after panic attack, thinking they're having a heart attack, and they go to the hospital, and the doctor wants to give them some kind of medicine to take down their anxiety because their heart's just fine. I've got to tell you something, guys. There are people in this world, there are more people in this world today that are dealing with issues like this, not this severe, obviously, boanthropy, but they're dealing with issues, and they need us to show them mercy. And the only way that we can do that is to break away from our sins that keep us from being merciful people. Because sin, I don't care what form it is, is going to take you away from mercy because sin will lead to greater and greater and greater and greater and greater pride. And doing right will lead to greater and greater and greater and greater and greater humility. Period. End of conversation. You notice what happened to him when humility became his, his primary character trait when, when everything became, when everything came together for him, and humility, even though he was still the king of Babylon, humility became his most obvious character trait. And from that humility was praise and honor and glory to God. It changed the way he looked at his suffering that God had brought into his life. He saw it as a blessing, not a curse. He saw the pain as progress not a problem. He saw problems as opportunities for growth. His whole humility changes our whole mindset. When we look at suffering with the eyes of pride, we don't see ourselves privileged to suffer like Christ suffered, but we see ourselves unjustly suffering, and we see it as an injustice. And though it may be an injustice in this world, God uses injustices to bring us two things— it's what Daniel says in verse 37, for all his works are truth and his ways are justice. It may seem unjust in our eyes and in the eyes of the world, but it's just before God. You want to know why? Because it takes us from who we were and takes us into who we were meant to be in him. Humble. Humble. Our vision here at our church is very simple. Following Jesus, loving truth, 
generously joyous, or excuse me, joyously generous. Renewal, that kind of renewal comes through followership and trust and joyous generosity. Yet trust demands dedication to a way of living that's unique, different than the standards our culture sets. What does following Jesus, loving truth, and generosity with joy require? It requires that you and I live in repentance that we are repenting and changing and growing and repenting and changing and growing. It requires redemption. In other words, we have to have that level of humility that says, I can't get myself out of this. Whether it is a mess that I've gotten myself into, consequences of sin, or if it's a sin that just so easily besets us and burdens us that we just can't defeat it. It's through the redemption, the redemptive work of Christ, buying us out, paying the debt, and empowering us through his redemptive power. And it requires, thirdly, it requires humility, realizing that we can't do it. We have to lean on God for everything. Jesus said it himself, apart from me, you can do nothing. How do we respond to a God who's delivered us from our pride or who is delivering us from our pride as God is? We follow his son. We love his word. And we're generous with others who are walking the path with us. We place our naked trust in him and his word through our choices and our actions. We yield up ourselves entirely to him. What should our message be then? It would be the message of David in Psalm 66, verse 16. Come and hear all who fear God, and I will tell of what he has done for my soul. I cried to him with my mouth, and he was extolled with my tongue. If I regard wickedness in my heart, the Lord will not hear. But certainly God has heard. He has given heed to the voice of my prayer. Blessed be God who has not turned away from my prayer nor his loving kindness from me. It's repentance. It's redemption. It's humility. It's following Jesus. It's loving truth. It's joyously generous. And I'll close with this statement by a man by the name of J.C. Ryle, a very famous expositor and preacher of bygone days, the late 18, early 1900s. He was the first Anglican bishop of Liverpool, England. He said this of people who are forgiven, like Nebuchadnezzar. Forgiven souls are humble. Forgiven souls are humble. Forgiven souls love Christ. Forgiven souls hate their sin. Forgiven souls seek holiness. And forgiven souls always are forgiving. And that's what we see in Nebuchadnezzar. A totally different man than he was at the end of chapter 3 or at the end of chapter 2 or in chapter 1. This is a man who my understanding is, as well as several other theologians, greater than me for sure, that this man became what we call a regenerate Jew. He trusted the God of heaven. And he walked away from Bel and Marduk and Ishtar and all the ones that he had worshipped before. What's God calling you to walk away from today? Because today, God wants to bring change so that he can redeem you from that and bring you to a deeper level of humility in him. And you know what it is, and you talk to him about it right now. Let's pray. While everybody's got their heads bowed and their eyes closed, I'm not going to pray. If you want to come here to the altar and talk to God about what it is that he wants you to repent of or change, I mean, come on down here because you ain't going to do it on your own. You're going to have to have the power of his redemptive power in your life to redeem you out of that. And if you don't want to come down here and pray, you don't have to. Pray right where you're at. But it's time for you to let God begin the process of taking you from pride to humility.
Start looking at the struggles that you have in your life as opportunities. You talk to God. And those of you at home, you do the same thing. Very quietly. Father God, we thank you for the God of loving kindness that you are, that you're constantly showing favor, and that you empower us through your redemptive power to break away from those things that you want us, from which you want us to repent. And in every step you take, you're bringing us to a deeper, a deeper level of humility, which is obviously a deeper level of holiness. May we be men and women who are following your son, loving your word, and joyously generous with both you and one another. Let us recognize how much we've been forgiven and live humble, loving Christ, hating the sin within us, seeking holiness, and always forgiving others. We love you. We love you, great Father. We love you, Lord Christ. We love you, blessed Spirit. Abba, brother, partner, thank you, blessed Trinity, for what you've taught us from the book of Daniel today. Thank you so much for Daniel and his determination that he would not defile himself. And from that choice, you you grew a life that made such an impact that the greatest, most powerful man on earth humbled himself before you, the living God. Lord, use us that way this week. In Christ's name I pray, amen. If you could sit tight just a minute, I got something to say.